Many of you might remember a case from 2015 about a parking charge that made its way all the way to the Supreme Court. In essence, the court had to decide whether or not this was a penalty and whether it was an unfair penalty in terms of a consumer situation and therefore rendered it unenforceable. Ultimately, the court decided that it was not unfair and Mr. Beavis lost the case against Parking Eye Limited. This provided some clarity for private car park management companies issuing parking charge notices. And so these are what I'm going to talk about today. But first of all, if you're new to me, I'm a barrister who helps you understand law, so make sure you subscribe and leave your comments down below. They might find their way into a video here, and if not, they'll make their way onto my sister channel, Black Belt Secrets, where I answer questions in the comments. So for clarity, in this video, I am talking about parking charge notices, not penalty charge notices, which are a separate thing, which I've talked about in another video, which I will link below in the description. In essence, the fundamental difference is that a parking charge notice is a private contract between you as the person parking the car and the company that is managing the car park. As private companies do not have the authority to issue you with a fine, any yellow ticket that is titled parking charge notice is therefore an invoice from the company for the parking or overstaying of parking whilst you've been on their land. And like any other form of contract, and if you are a consumer, then you will be protected by the Consumer Rights Act 2015 and the Consumer Contract Regulations, all of which provide that terms in a contract must not be unfair. And just to illustrate how strong this point is, despite Parking Eye winning their case at the Supreme Court in 2015, Parking Eye lost a case against Mr. Nicholas Bowen QC just a couple of years later. Just like Mr. Beavis, Mr. Boeing QC was issued a parking charge notice of £85. Only this time Mr. Boeing defended the claim on the basis that it was unfair for a parking eye to charge overstayers at a service station car park whilst they were there at night. Part of Mr. Boeing's defence was that the writing setting out the parking charges was not only in a different part of the car park to where he was parked, but the writing was, as he put it, microscopic print that required 20-20 vision or a magnifying glass to read it. The important part about this is that the writing and the sign was far away in tiny writing, that it wouldn't have been reasonable for somebody to have been able to see that notice and therefore be on notice of the parking charges. And thus, at a station car park at night, it was unreasonable. Reportedly, the judge struck out the claim and ordered Parking Eye to pay £1,550 in costs. So this is very important because not only was the amount the same and effectively the principles of the charge were the same to begin with, the case was differentiated on the basis that there were elements of the facts of the particular situation that made that case unreasonable, unfair and thus unenforceable, such as is consumer contract law. So for the purposes of this video, I'm going to look at the formation of a contract on private land in the situation of a parking charge and the requirements and the circumstances that you can be chased and forced to pay a parking charge and potentially how you can challenge it. As usual, there is an overarching piece of legislation that we can look to and there is more upcoming law which is in the process of being drafted. So make sure you subscribe because there will be more videos on this very subject coming further down the line. But for now, the Protection of Freedoms Act of 2012 makes several provisions, one of which actually bans private companies from wheel clamping and either blocking in or removing vehicles from their land, ultimately meaning ticketing, or rather issuing parking charge notices, has become the predominant way of enforcing the parking regulations on their private car park. The Act also has provisions that enable these private companies to pursue the owner or registered keeper of a vehicle if they are unable to identify the driver of the vehicle or the driver refuses to identify himself, before which it was the driver alone that could be held responsible for such charges. Just a couple of notes on immobilizing or wheel clamping a vehicle before we continue. First of all, not only is it an either way offense to immobilize a vehicle without lawful authority, Lawful authority will usually be by a local authority, for example, under the Traffic Management Act. Again, see my other video linked below. And equally, it is an either way offence to tow away or even move or remove a vehicle, again, without local authority. 
So private companies should not be wheel clamping vehicles and they should not be towing them away for the avoidance of doubt. However, in the situation, if you do come back and you find that your vehicle has been wheel clamped, I have heard of people taking an angle grinder to cut the thing off. This would amount to criminal damage because it is not your property, even though it is affixed to your vehicle illegally. If it were possible to remove the clamp without causing damage to it, then you may have reasonable excuse to interfere with their property so long as it's not damaged. But the strict guidance would be to pay any fee under protest that they've demanded for release of the clamp. And then ultimately, if they don't give it back to you, sue them in court to recover it because the clamping of the vehicle was illegal in the first place. So back to the formation of a contract on private land where a driver drives onto the land to park. Now, whilst many people will be familiar with the phrase, if it isn't written down, it didn't happen. This is not true. A contract can be formed even though it isn't written out by each party and isn't signed by each party. The mere fact that there would be signs up in the car park to tell the driver that there are charges applicable when parking on the land is sufficient so long as they are sufficiently clear to imply acceptance of those terms when the driver parks on the land. I should also highlight that such terms should also be fair as well as sufficiently clear because if a term turns out to be unfair, then it's likely to be unenforceable. For example, if the sign says that it's a thousand pounds an hour for parking, this is almost certainly going to be unfair and unenforceable. So the visibility of both the signs and the writing on the signs is of paramount importance because again, as in Mr. Bowen's case, if the writing is absolutely tiny in a small sign on the far side of the car park, then it's unlikely that anyone is going to see it and arguable that you haven't accepted those terms of a contract, even though you've turned up to park on private land. On the other hand, the reverse might be true, even if it is not a car park and clearly not a car park, but there is a sign up that clearly says you will be charged if you are parked there illegally and without permission. Just because it is not a car park doesn't mean that you haven't accepted those terms by implication by parking on the land if there is a sufficiently clear sign with a fair term that you are deemed to be accepting if you do park on that land. So back to the legislation, it is section 56 that gives effect to schedule four, which means that private companies can pursue the registered keeper of the vehicle if the driver has either refused to identify himself or they are unable to identify the driver. Because of course, if the driver is not the registered keeper and there's no other evidence as to who was driving, the only way of finding out who is responsible for the vehicle is of course the registered keeper. But in order to find out the details of the registered keeper, the private company would need to make an application to the DVLA, the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Agency, under the reasonable course provision, under the Road Vehicle Regulations of 2002. But generally, insofar as private parking operators go, this is only usually possible for those that are members of an accredited trade association, such as the British Parking Association. So taking the scenario where a driver has parked on private land and overstayed and been issued a parking charge notice, let's look at what is required for a private company to pursue those fees against the registered keeper. So the starting point is that a private company can only exercise its right to claim these fees from the registered keeper. Once a notice to keeper has been given and several conditions have been met. One scenario is where the parking charge is handed physically to the driver of the vehicle who might accept that a charge is due and duly pays the charge and that's the end of the matter. Alternatively, the parking charge might be affixed to the vehicle, often yellow, looking very much like a penalty charge notice. Remember that that is different. A penalty charge is a fine, a parking charge is an invoice. But again, the driver may well believe that this parking charge was due because the driver did overstay, accepts liability, pays the charge. Again, that's the end of the matter. But in either of those scenarios, if the driver and perhaps in turn the keeper of the vehicle provides no response to the private company, then these four conditions must apply. The first condition is for the company to show that they have the right to enforce these unpaid parking charges against the driver but are unable to determine who the driver was because they don't know the driver's name and they don't know the driver's address. But in satisfying this condition, the company must be able to show that there was a valid contract in place 
This is usually by demonstrating that there were signs on entry to the car park or perhaps signs which were clearly visible on the car park or if it was not a car park that there was clearly a sign there to say that there were charges applicable for unauthorized parking. But either way, a combination of those facts and relative signage should be enough to show that there was an implied acceptance of the terms of that contract by driving onto this land and parking or perhaps overstaying. The second requirement is that the company needs to show that they've detected unauthorized parking, be that parking for any length of time without a ticket, overstaying the amount of time that's been paid for, or parking on the land when parking is unauthorized altogether. And in addition to detecting that there's been unpaid parking charges, the company needs to show that they've either handed one of these notices to the driver, affixed it to the vehicle, or sent it directly through the post, usually when there's been a remote detection such as number plate cameras and there isn't anybody physically putting tickets onto the vehicles. There are some timescales involved in this which form part of the next condition that the company must satisfy. That is that the company must satisfy that they've made an application to the DVLA under the reasonable cause provisions to obtain the name and address of the registered keeper of the vehicle. And part of this requirement is that this must be done within what the legislation calls the relevant period. And that is different depending on how this notice has been given in the first place. Firstly, when there's been a notice to the driver, remember this is either handing it to the driver or affixing it to the vehicle, the application to the DVLA must be made 28 days after this notice was given and no response has been received. The DVLA will then likely respond with the registered details and a notice to the keeper can be issued thereafter to those relevant details. On the other hand, like many large car parks that have remote systems for detecting entry and exit of vehicles and the duration paid for, in these scenarios, the application to the DVLA must be made within 14 days of the alleged parking contravention. Now, as I said, companies that are members of a recognized and accredited trade organization will be able to find these details more easily, usually electronically. Whilst other companies can still make an application, they will have to show that they have reasonable cause to obtain the details and they might find it more difficult. But so long as they can provide enough information, they may well satisfy this provision and obtain the details from the DVLA. And the final condition that these companies must satisfy is that they've complied with any relevant regulations under this act and schedule. This generally covers the situation where further regulations can be made and it's just a general requirement that all of those regulations and requirements are met by the private company before they can enforce their right to claim these unpaid parking charges from the registered keeper. Now, whilst it's unlikely that major parking organizations are going to get the following things wrong, there are certain requirements that a notice to driver and notice to keeper must have in order to be a valid notice. These things, as you can imagine, include all relevant details, such as the vehicle that was involved, the land, requirements to pay, the signs that were there, what the charges are, how long the vehicle has been overstayed, how to pay such charges, any discounts involved in paying such charges, and to whom these charges should be paid. All of which relevant to the specific time and date on the parking charge notice. So one of the obvious things here is that if you can demonstrate that your vehicle was not in that place at that time, then you will have a prima facie on the face of it case that your parking charge was not valid so long as you can demonstrate that the vehicle was in fact somewhere else. So however unlikely this might seem, they are things that you want to check that they are correct first. For example, some of the information on the notice might say that there is a large sign on the entry to the car park telling you what those charges are. Now with a bit of imagination, many of these things might change from time to time, and perhaps on the day that you entered the car park, this sign simply wasn't there. How will you know that? Well, you will only know that if you've got a photograph and some evidence of the car park at that moment in time. When I enter a car park, I will take photographs of any signage that are up at that time because if the parking charges were changed, for example, and I was unfortunate enough to be given a parking charge which has incorrect information on it, then effectively the notice is invalid because the notice doesn't marry up with the details that are on the sign. Equally, if there was no sign on entry to the car park when you drove in and you have a photograph to show this, but their notice tells you that there is a sign there, perhaps it's a new sign that's recently been put up there, then obviously that notice contains incorrect information, 
Whilst it might be true on the day that they send it out to you, it may not have been true when you entered the car park. So however unlikely any of these things might seem, you will only be able to show these if you are prepared in advance when entering a car park by taking a quick snap of any relevant signage that's around in the car park. One of the primary differences in the requirements for a notice to keeper is that it should also say that there has been a notice to the driver with the relevant information. Again, if there hasn't been a notice to the driver or this notice to keeper doesn't contain those details, that notice is therefore potentially invalid. Taking the scenario now where the registered keeper receives this notice to keeper but actually determines who was driving the vehicle at the time, the registered keeper may well provide the details of the driver to the private parking company who may then directly enforce those parking charges against the driver. On the other hand, if the keeper simply ignores the notice and refuses to pay the charge, then the private company can then take enforcement action against the registered keeper of that vehicle. However, it will be open to the keeper or indeed the driver to go through the relevant appeals process, usually by saying that the parking charge was unfair perhaps because the signs were too small or the signs were covered in snow or dirt too far away or too small. Any of these reasons can form part of the appeal and through that appeals process, it is possible that this parking charge is simply canceled. If the private company is a member of an accredited trade association, the relevant period for making these representations is usually within 28 days of receiving the notice to driver or the notice to the keeper, after which a determination can be made on said appeal. But ultimately, after all is said and done, the private company can only force you to pay this parking charge by taking you to court. But remember, if you ignore the parking charge in the first place, there may well be further charges applied, there may be interest applied, and if the company actually issues the claim in court, there will be court issue fees and then hearing fees thereafter, which if you lose the case, you are likely to be liable for those fees. But remember Mr. Boeing QC's case where he successfully argued that it was unfair to levy these charges on a service station car park for drivers that have overstayed at night, which goes to show that it really does make a difference to get proper advice on your specific facts of the case, as shown by Mr. Boeing QC's case against Mr. Beavis's case that made its way all the way to the Supreme Court. So if you come back to your car and you find a parking charge notice on there, I hope that you remember all of the things that I've said in this video. And if you need any help, of course, you need to get in touch with someone for formal legal advice, be that with me or with anybody else. But I would urge you to take advice on your specific circumstances if you have a matter of principle that you don't want to pay the charge. In the meantime, thanks for watching, stay humble and subscribe.